Chapter 6, Section 5. What other effects would free market justice have? <clears throat> Such a system would be dangerous simply because of the power it places in the hands of companies. As Michael Taylor notes, whether the protection market is competitive or not, it must be remembered that the product is a peculiar one. When we buy cars or shoes or telephone services, we do not give the firm power based on force, but armed protection agencies like the state make customers, their own and others, vulnerable. And having given them power, we cannot be sure that they will use it simply for our own protection. Community, Anarchy, and Liberty, page 65. As we argued above, there are many reasons to believe that our protection market will place most of society, bar the wealthy elite, in a vulnerable position. One such reason is the assumption of the so-called anarcho-capitalists themselves. As they note, capitalism is marked by an extreme division of labor. Instead of everyone having this, all the skills they need, these skills are distributed throughout society and all, so it is claimed, benefit. This applies equally to the defense market. Some people su subscribe to a defense firm because they either cannot or do not want the labor of having to protect their own property in person. The skills of defense, therefore, are concentrated in these companies, and so the firms will have an advantage in terms of experience and mental state. They're trained to fight, as well as, seems likely, weaponry. This, seems, uh, this means that normal people will be at somewhat of a disadvantage if a cartel of defense firms decides to act coercively. The division of labor society will discourage the spread of skills required to sustain warfare throughout the society, and so perhaps ensure that the customers remain vulnerable. The price of liberty may be eternal vigilance, but are most people willing to include eternal preparation of war as well? For modern society, the answer seems to be no. They prefer to let others do that, namely the state and its armed forces, and we should note an armed society may be a polite one, but its politeness comes from fear, not mutual respect, and so totally phony and soul-destroying, frankly. If we look at inequality within society, this may produce a ghettoization effect within so-called anarcho-capitalism. As David Friedman notes, conflict between defense firms is bad for business. Conflict costs money, both in terms of weaponry used and increased danger money wages. For this reason, he thinks that peaceful cooperation will, ex uh, will exist between firms. However, if we look at poor areas with higher crime rates, then it's clear that such an area would be a dangerous place. In other words, it's very likely to be high in conflict. But conflict increases costs and so prices. Does, mean that, does this mean that those areas which need the, uh, the defense the most will have the highest prices for enforcement? That's the case with insurance now. So perhaps we would see whole areas turning into like a Habesian anarchy simply because the high cost associated with the dangerous areas will make the effective demand for their services approach zero. In a system based on private statism, police and justice would be determined by free market forces. Right libertarians maintain that one would have few rights on other people's property, and so the owner's, would, the owner's will would be the law, possibly restricted somewhat by a general libertarian law code, perhaps not. See the previous section. In this situation, those who could not afford police protection would become victims of roving bandits and rampant crime, resultant in a society where the wealthy are securely protected in their bastions by their own armed forces, with a bunch of poor, uh, poor crowded around them for protection. This would become very similar to feudal Europe. The competing police forces would also be attempting to execute the laws of their sponsors in areas that may not be theirs to begin with, which would lead to conflicts unless everyone agreed to follow a general libertarian law code as Rothbard for one wants, if there were competing law codes, the problem of whose law to select and enforce would arise, with each of the wealthy security sponsors desiring their law control all of the land. As noted earlier, if there were one libertarian law code, this would be a monopoly of government over a given area and therefore statist by definition. In addition, it should be noted that right libertarians claim that under their system, anarchistic associations would be allowed as long as they are formed voluntarily, just reflects their usual vacuous concept of freedom. 
This is because such associations would exist within and be subject to the general libertarian law code of the so-called anarcho-capitalist society. These laws would, re would reflect and protect the interests and power of those with capitalist property, meaning that unless these owners agree... Trying to live an anarchist life would be nearly impossible. It's all fine and well to say those with property can do what they like. If you don't have property, then experimentation could prove difficult, not to mention, of course, few areas are completely self-sufficient, meaning that anarchistic associations will be subject to market forces, market forces which stress and reward the opposite of these values that the communes would be set up to create. Thus, you have to buy the right to be free. If, as anarchists desire... Most people refuse to recognize or defend the rights of private property uh, and freely associate according to organize their own lives and ignore their bosses. This would be still class of, uh, classed as initiation of force under a so-called anarcho-capitalist society and thus repressed. In other words, like any authoritarian system, the rules within anarcho-capitalism do not involve with society and its changing concepts. This can be seen from the popularity of natural law with right libertarians, the authoritarian nature of which will be discussed in chapter 16. Therefore, any so-called anarcho-capitalism that you're free to follow the capitalist laws and act within the limits of these laws, it's only within the context that you can experiment if you can afford to. If you act outside those laws, then you're subject to coercion. The amount of coercion required to prevent such action depends on how willing people are to respect the laws. Hence, it's not the case that so-called anarcho-capitalist society is particularly conducive to social experimentation and free evolution as it advocates like to claim. Indeed, the opposite may be the case, as any capitalist system will have vast differences of wealth and power within it, thus ensuring the ability to experiment is limited to those who can afford to. As Jonathan Wolf pointed out, the image of people freely moving from one utopia to another until they find their heaven ignores the thought that certain choices may be irreversible. This thought may lead to speculation about whether a law of evolution would apply to the plural utopias. Perhaps in the long run, we may find the framework regulated by the law of survival of the economically most fit, and so we would expect to see a development not of diversity, but homogene homogeneity. These communities with great market power would eventually soak up all but the most resistant of those communities around them. Robert Nozick, Property uh, Justice in the Minimal State, page 135. And if the initial distribution of resources is similar to that already existing, then the economically most fit will be capitalistic. The capital, capitalist market actively selects against cooperatives, even though they are more productive. Given the head start provided by statism, it seems likely that explicit capitalist utopias would remain the dominant type, particularly as the rights framework is such to protect capitalist property rights. Moreover, we doubt that most so-called anarcho-capitalists would embrace the ideology if it were more than likely that non-capitalist utopias would overcome the capitalist ones. After all, they are self-proclaimed capitalists. So given that so-called anarcho-capitalists who follow Murray Rothbard's ideas and minimal statist right libertarians agree that all must follow the basic general libertarian law code, which defends capitalist property rights, we can safely say that the economically most fit would be the capitalist ones. Hardly surprising if the law code reflects capitalist ideas of right and wrong. In addition, George Reitzer has argued, see the McDonaldization of society, capitalism is driven towards standardization and conformity by its own logic. This suggests that plurality of communities would soon be replaced by a series of communities which share the same features of hierarchy and ruling elites. So-called anarcho-capitalists who follow David Friedman's ideas consider it possible, perhaps likely, that a free market in laws will result in one standard law code. So this applies to that school as well. So in the end, the so-called anarcho-capitalists argue that their system, you are free to follow the capitalist law and work in the capitalist economy, and if you are lucky, take part in a commune as a collective capitalist. How very generous of them. Of course, any attempt to change said rules or economy are illegal and should be stopped by private states. As well as indicating the falsity of so-called anarcho-capitalist claims to support experimentation, this discussion has also indicated that coercion would not be absent from their system. 
This would be the case only if everyone voluntarily respected private property rights and abided by the law, i.e. acted in a capitalist approved way. As long as you follow the law, you're fine, which is exactly the same as public statism. Moreover, if the citizens of a society don't want a capitalist order, it may require a lot of coercion to impose it. This can be seen from the experiences of Italian factory occupations in 1920, in which workers refused to accept capitalist property or authority as valid and ignored it. In response to this change of thought within a large part of society, the capitalists backed fascism in order to stop the evolutionary process within society. The socialist economic historian Maurice Dobbs, after reviewing the private armies in 1920s and the 1930s America, made very much the same point. Quote, when business policy takes the step of financing and arming a mass political movement to capture the machinery of government, to outlaw opposing forms of organization, and suppress hostile opinions, we have merely a further and more logical stage beyond private armies. Noted, Australian, uh, Australian, noted Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, has, whose extreme free market liberal political and economic ideas inspired right libertarianism in many ways, had this to say about fascism. It cannot be denied that fascism and similar movements aiming at the establishment of dictatorships are full of the best intentions and that their intention, that their intervention has for the moment saved European civilization. The merit that fascism has thereby won for itself will live eternally in history. This example illustrates the fact that capitalism per se is essentially authoritarian because it's necessarily based on coercion and hierarchy, which explains why capitalists have resorted to the most extreme forms of authoritarianism, including totalitarian dictatorship during crises, a crises that threaten the fundamental rules of the system itself. There's no reason to think that so-called anarcho-capitalism would be any different in this regard. With this system, with its private states, since they don't actually want to get rid of hierarchical forms of authority, the need for one government to unify the enforcement activities of the various defense companies becomes quickly apparent. In the end, that is what so-called anarcho-capitalism recognizes within its general libertarian law code, based either on market forces or natural law. Thus, it appears that one government hierarchy over a given territory is inevitable under any form of capitalism. That being the case, it's obvious that a democratic form of statism with its checks and balances is preferable to a dictatorship that impl uh, imposes absolute property rights and so absolute power. Of course, we do have another option rather than private or public statism. 